We came into a curriculum which was perfectly laid down with the exception of one elective course. We took a writing course and everybody took the writing course and we wrote three papers a week. We took a physics course and everybody took the physics course and darn near everybody just really struggled with it, except those of us who happened to be in the sciences and you know it was, it was sort of okay. We all had a math course, we all had a history course. And then there was something else that we could tack on. I remember I took French. Uh, but that was the one elective. Otherwise, for the, really for the first year and partway into the second year, it was perfectly well laid down. Now that sounds, by our standards today, horrifying. It wasn't. It was, a, it was a very good curriculum, having been hammered out for the last couple of decades by the faculty. It gave us all a common experience. And I sometimes wonder whether, in fact, the fact that we did have that sort of commonality of experience in our particular school uh, led to a different set of standards, a different relationship to the whole question of what was happening in the 60s. We weren't out there trying to find a sense of family and community and common experience and all of that. In a sense, intellectually, we already had it. So I think probably for a lot of us, and I, I remember thinking, I remember noticing, in fact, that uh, my class, the class of 65, was really the last, I thought, of the classes that had that particular character. I could see and I remember I was rushing chairman for my fraternity, so I was, I was looking pretty closely at the kids two years uh, below, you know. And uh, they were a different bunch in the way that they dressed, in the kinds of, of attitudes that they had, the sort of, of innate anti-traditionalism, perhaps. I mean, we were anti-traditional in a, in a thoughtful and perhaps forced way. And it was exciting and bizarre and new and different to be, to be going against the conventions. Those kids sort of had it from somewhere within, if you know what I mean. You're beginning to run into people who, who make it a habit, and it makes you uncomfortable, of disrespect in the classroom. That that's just what you're supposed to do is to challenge in a disrespectful way what's up there teaching you. While all the rest of us who sort of come in from this other tradition are saying, ooh, wait a minute, that's, that's not nice. I mean, I hate the guy too, but he's a professor. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, you see, one of the things that was going on, it seems to me, at the good liberal arts colleges at that time was uh, a real conviction that what mattered was what Dewey called the life of the mind. The whole question of the intelligent structure, the, the understanding of rationality and all of that. You poured yourself into that. You learned to reason as closely as you could and to debate as, as tightly as possible, that kind of thing. And if there was a room for what you might call intuition and creativity and the arts and all of that. Well, that was out there, but that was a nice kind of adjunct. And it certainly wasn't something that, that kept up to the caliber in terms of what you were supposed to be doing of this other side, this sort of, of rational side of things. And I guess it may be that I sensed that breaking down in the kids who were, just, who were, who were sophomores when I was a senior, that kind of thing. Uh, they were much more willing to say, hey, wait a minute, feeling, feeling matters. You know, as Cummings said, since feeling is first, uh, the, the, the feelings of things really are there. And yeah, OK, it's, it's nice to keep on going and, and learn something of the rational side of things, but there's a lot more to it. And part of that more also had to do with the, with the political structure that was going on around us. I think, I think probably I was in the last of the classes, at least at Amherst, which was sort of genuinely apolitical really wasn't all that entangled in the, in the affairs of politics. And maybe it was just my own upbringing. Or, uh, I don't think so. I think it was broader than that, that there was a sense in which uh, if you were a joiner, the kind of person who went out and got involved in things and, and took up political roles, to a certain extent you were engaged in a distraction from what really mattered. What really mattered was that sense of the, of the scholarliness, the, the understanding, the depth. Of, of things. And I could see that changing, as I say, even as I was there. The problem is you're talking to somebody who was genuinely in this sort of apolitical stance at that time. Now, now things changed rapidly later, but at that point, uh, I guess I was still persuaded that what mattered was this sense of the, you, you, you work in a kind of a solitary mold. Things happen when you're by yourself because that's when you're most deeply learning and understanding and grasping what's going on. The places where, where great change occurs are in the library, in your study carol, and not out there on the street. 
And that's why for many of us, I think it was a puzzle to see these people out there in the street imagining that something they were doing really did matter. When we had been taught that what really mattered was something that was an in, a much more interior kind of a thing.